<clears throat> it's a little bit of change of um, scope and perspective. I'm going to look at the Earth from a satellite. Let me um, just set the tone here. This is the CHAMP. It's a challenging something or other mini payload. This is SWARM, a sequence of uh, missions. This is a three satellite mission with a vector magnetometer on board and also a scalar magnetometer. And it too has been flying around the Earth and collecting vector valued magnetometry data um, in space along their uh, various orbits. And just to end with a result that we can look at, like uh, an Earth or a map of something, well, so here's an example of an, an older um, model of the magnetic field that is due to the terrestrial lithosphere. So that's the rocks that make up the Earth. That's nothing to do with space. That's nothing to do with stellar radiation or the sun or anything else that is time dependent. That's geology speaking to us through the rocks and through the magnetic field. Okay, so those are the type of pictures that we like to look at. And this particular one is a low order filtered rendition, but already you see structure, notably you see of course the continents emerging out of this uh, field structure. Here is a much, much higher resolution detail of something in, in, a, in a cool flyover type of rendition. Um, I'm colorblind myself, but there are uh, continental outlines on, on it. And regardless of this, you could probably guess where this is. This is looking north, um, uh, sort of along a line of longitude in the Atlantic, and we're supposed to see Spain around here somewhere, and here's Gibraltar around here somewhere. And so, of course, these lines here are the magnetic stripes that define the opening of the Atlantic Ocean Basin. So uh, it's been exactly, I think, 50 years to the day of plate tectonics being uh, a thing now. And so it's these uh, magnetic stripes on the ocean floor that really showed us how completely different the oceans are from the continent and that uh, we need to study or can fruitfully study the magnetic field of the Earth's and other planets' lithospheres to deduce something interesting about their geology, their planetary dynamics and evolution. Here's Mars, okay, so Mars has been flown over by other uh, missions, and so here this is draped on a background of topography here. Uh, the main things to know about Mars is that it sort of looks like, a, like an ice cream cone with chocolate sauce dripping over it because that top part of it is completely sort of geologically different from the bottom part. And then there was a lot of play about 10, 15 years ago about these magnetic anomalies in this region in the south, which suddenly, again, looked interesting, and nowhere uh, uh, do we see patterns like this, so they're unique and interesting. And so there is information in the field, that's the start of the analysis. Next thing that we need to do from the field is to infer what the properties are, what causes these anomalies, and so on. But at the very beginning, it's about collecting data from satellites and airplanes and handheld uh, meters and so on, and putting it together in a framework that illuminates the local and the global structure of our uh, objects of interest, uh, Earth and planets. Um, just to stick this in here, the traditional analysis, um, which um, uh, is a quick illustration here, this is a radial component, a tangential component, and another tangential component of a field vector. So we have vector-valued fields. And here are lines of these satellites they are flying. I'm not showing the altitude. They're flying out a couple of hundred kilometers, and they're dipping in and out of, of, of this field here, so there are different altitudes. And the stripes are showing where they have collected these magnetic data. Uh, uh, one of the oldest way of modeling data like this is to pretend that there are literally little dipoles buried on the surface of the planet, like a little fridge magnet that, that um, uh, induces and, and um, generates that field. And if you do this for this particular data set, this particular patch on that place of Mars, which is otherwise of no relevance, then you get a sort of a model for that top um, radial and collatitudinal longitudinal uh, component of the field vector that you can explain sort of to this type of um, uh, fit here. So the bottom line is a model based on exactly one dipole whose strength and orientation was best fitting this sort of uh, observed pattern. Clearly, that's the simplest of all models, is to stick dipoles all over the surface, and yet that is a common uh, uh, type of analysis. Okay. 
So let me return to the Earth for uh, the sake of examples here. This is that same picture. This is actually filtered through spherical harmonic degree 72. Um, it's not our model. Um, and uh, it's, it's what I showed you earlier, the exact same thing. It's in, in practice, it's a radial component of the magnetic field at uh, uh, equivalent volumetric radius. OK, so the statement of the problem, it was well pointed out here. We have to tell uh, each other what we're trying to do. So I drew it on a, I like to say cocktail napkins, but I didn't have any napkins nor any cocktails. So um, <laughs> here is a satellite, OK? This is the real problem. It's, these are sort of so solar panels. And it's measuring a vector of a, of a field. Like you hold your, uh, like there is one uh, in your iPhone, the Fluxgate directional um, uh, micro Tesla, it, it will tell you. Um, now, what we are feeling from the planetary field is the internally generated field that is coming at us from the object that we are hovering above. And so the, all the planetary dynamics, the convection in the Earth's core, that's generating actively the field, which is inducing a field in the lithospheric uh, a couple of hundred uh, kilometers, which itself has a remnant from past plate tectonic activity and all of that ocean stuff that you saw. Now that's V here, so that's the field that is coming from our own body of interest. But we're flying through space and there are other bodies of interest and they're having their field projected onto a, a, us as well. So the big problem is that when you're at the satellite here, you have a field W that's coming you, to you from Mars, the sun, some other uh, place. And so at this point, this satellite here, which is flying from on some orbit that is not in the same uh, uh, depth but, or altitude, but that's some average satellite altitude, it's collecting these data where at every point the field vector will be the superposition of the gradient of that W potential coming from another planet and the gradient of the V potential, which is coming from the object of interest. And we really want to study V so we can do geology. Core mantle boundary, inner core boundary, the Earth, the surface of the Earth, the shell here that um, uh, contains everywhere the satellites will be between, bounded by the surface of the Earth, the hard piece of the Earth, and then some um, uh, reference radius R sub Q. Within this shell, we assume there are no sources, such that there are indeed potential free, uh, uh, potential uh, gradient fields. Uh, we're not looking here at time dependence. We're not looking at, at uh, flowing ions and, and anything like that. Um, and then the uh, problem that I haven't mentioned yet is that invariably, <coughs> our domain of interest, as a geologist, it could be Australia versus the Atlantic, or our domain of data collection is only a piece of the Earth. Because no matter how long the satellites fly around, they're always missing a piece. There are always gaps in the track. There are always polar caps missing. OK, so I drew that on my napkin. And then Alain Plattner, who's um, the title slide flipped by. I haven't properly mentioned him. Alain Plattner is now at uh, a university, uh, California, California State University, Fresno. So he drew this, the Earth, RP, the planet, RQ, this bounding thing for the shell and then a satellite is flying in and out of this um, average altitude. OK, so uh, scalar potentials. So V is at a particular altitude, little r, not bold, r hat, which is the surface of our, our unit uh, sphere. And so um, uh, Laplace's equation holds everywhere within the shell. That's a statement of physics, not of mathematics. And as a result, we are in principle able to represent the internally generated magnetic potential as a superposition of standard, normal, uh, common spherical harmonics on the surface of the planet, weighted by coefficients, which are in blue, which we really want to know, which are up or down weighted in this degree dependent fashion as you remove yourself from the source of that body. And so the uh, extraction of the coefficients in principle on a piece of paper is through orthogonality where you map the potential back uh, onto those functions. Then W, which is that other field that's coming from other planets, is just like it except that it's decay, R over RP, R over RQ, is no longer with negative L but it's with positive L because they extinguish at uh, infinity compared to another reference point. The source of our own planet 
if we put the uh, center of the Earth there and call it zero, then at infinity our internal field decays to zero, and is of course the opposite for the other planet. So I've just uh, introduced this YLM, this standard spherical harmonics. If I'm going to talk about a whole bunch of them, I will put them in this curly Y here. They're just a regular normalized surface spherical harmonics that you probably learned about in, 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 uh, in uh, physics. And L is my notation for the angular degree, uh, roughly uh, scaling with wavelengths. Higher is smaller wavelength, and then M circling between negative L and L is the order, which is how that energy is, is partitioned across nodal lines of latitude and longitude. So the uh, basis, if you want to call it, uh, as a solid harmonic, so we call it the inner solid harmonics, are R to the L of these spherical harmonics. They're a basis for W, generated by the external source that we really want to get rid of. And then the outer harmonics of the solid are R to negative L minus one of the spherical harmonics, which are basis for the V, the stuff that we really want to know for our planet. And so because we work in this, this uh, charge-free uh, uh, space, we are going to combine these uh, scalar surface harmonics into vector-valued um, harmonics, which we call E and F. And if we do it this way, and you'll notice there isn't a third term, there isn't a so-called toroidal term because we don't need it in here. If we do it this way and we normalize it, then we have a vector spherical harmonic basis of which there are many choices. And using this choice, we have an orthonormal one. And we have on top of that, that what we really measure, the B field, which is the superposition of this internally generated and externally generated field, is represented by um, a, a linear combination, again, of these new E vector harmonics and the new F vector harmonics. And so all these terms, the A sub L here, that tell you how from the inside out the terms attenuate, and the A with that cup that shows you it's from the outside in, um, this is how the up and downward continued operators work for these vector harmonics. And the beauty of the, or the simplicity, or convenience of the rearrangement is that if you have the th triple vector components at one point that you can predict, if you know them exactly, from the coefficients, what all the values are elsewhere. That's, that's what is meant by up and downward continued. Of course, these are all models. Um, we still haven't found these coefficients. Of course, it still goes to infinity because it's just in principle this is what's happening. Okay, so I haven't actually defined the problem until now because I'm returning to it. Okay, the problem is here's the satellite with the whole geometry and the symbols that I defined. And what we want to know is, well, we collect data at points where the satellite flies, and it will be a superposition of the internal and the external fields, and it will be contaminated by noise, and it will be available in a region where we have it available, and it will not be available elsewhere. And then what we try to do, and here is the problem statement, it is to obtain from discrete satellite data collected within a somewhat confined region of actual space, 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 um, at varying altitude above this planetary surface, approximated by a sphere of a radius r sub pi, that we really would like to find the, uh, as many as we can, so, but an invariably band-limited set of coefficients that tells us what the internally generated potential is of the planetary field so that we can have it, look at it, and then knowing the relations, look at it from a, uh, everywhere and, and uh, uh, make predictions of uh, where it's coming from and where it's going to. And then do geology, geodynamics, and geophysics. Yeah. I'm just not writing the dependence on phi. The dependence on phi is everywhere. Right, so the R with the hat is theta and phi. It's the, it's the surface coordinate on the sphere. And the phi dependence and the theta dependence is contained in the, rear, in the arrangement of these L and M coefficients. And if so, if L equals M, though, there'll be a particular phi dependence if L is smaller than, and so on. So it's all in there. It's definitely theta, phi, and R dependent. Yes, but, but we're in a session on inverse problems, and we don't have the coefficients yet. But if I have them, I will, and that's exactly what you're saying. Yeah. 
So the inverse problem is to find the coefficients from these data, which have this superposition, which we need to separate, and the contamination, and the localization, and the band limitation. Those are really the elements. It's not everywhere. It's not wide band. It's a superposition, and we only want one thing. Um, now, that's kind of a lot, right? So that's what we have to do. So I'm going to do a little housekeeping. I'm going to put these blue unknown coefficients just in sort of a vector so I can work with it a little bit. So the internal field, um, uh, 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 I'm going to start labeling. This is a, a technical detail. It starts at 0, 0, and not at uh, 1 minus 1. So here are the internal field coefficients, which we don't have yet. But if we do, we know everything about it. And here is the Ws. And so I must let the band limitation, the 0 through L here, go to a certain L. And then this outer field, I may not have it. I may not want it. It may not exist. Um, to a different L, 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 O for, for outer field. I'm going to just start writing A and A cup for the internal and out, uh, uh, outside uh, continuation matrices or operators. And so they're diagonal matrices. And I'm going to not write it if it's at the satellite. And so it turns a scalar coefficient into a vector component of something that then also has its dependence in space completely prescribed. And of course, there's one for the internal and one for the external field. And then I'm going to uh, keep using these curly ones to collect those vector harmonics into, into sets, into uh, uh, vectors here. Curly E and curly F are going to, that's my dictionary. That's my building block. Okay? And I know that across the entire sphere, E is orthogonal, orthonormal with all the other ones in E and with F and vice versa. But as you probably will see coming, that's going to not be the case for the regional data. So just to hammer the point home, the grad of the internal potential at a satellite altitude and then a theta phi coordinate is going to be this combination of these coefficients. The coefficients, turn them into a vector, evaluate the vector, and then I'm splitting it here into a low bandwidth that I hope to recover, and then an infinitely wide complement that I will never get. And the same for W, combining the Fs. So W times A transpose times F is a spatial expansion of this gradient vector field for the external potential. And it's in two pieces, a band-limited portion and then the wide band contamination that I will need to think about, but that I can't get. Um, so now I'm going to do the oldest uh, least squares problem in the book. I'm just going to say that measured over the area of supposedly somewhat dense availability, so I can write the integral and I don't have to pixelize it, although we do that in practice, I need to find the field model that combines these v's and these w's, which I want to know, with the known a's and f's, such that they match the data on average in the square over this uh, region of interest. And I need to minimize over all these possible coefficients to try to get, and now this is the appearance of the hat, to get the estimated coefficients both for the internal and the external field. And then I need to see how well my estimates work. And first, I need to see how I will do it. So that's the solution then, right? It's a least square solution for a noisily and an incompletely observed vector valued variable altitude noise contaminated inner outer field of a planetary potential. And so uh, that's what we're solving. So I write that again. And then now I see all these coupling terms up here. Um, if we write this a little neatly here, then we're seeing that the, the right-hand side of this equation is how the data is being felt up by the E's and the F's, right, over the region of data availability and then turned into coefficients. So these are the normal equations for this problem. And then here you have these product terms. And if you had <coughs> data everywhere, densely and in a regular spherical harmonic transform, this would just be an identity matrix because you would have orthogonality. But we don't have an identity because we have regional availability. And then not to mention we have this A and A cup here that talk to each other. And so this sort of combined uh, uh, inner product matrix here with these inner products in here is what we are tempted to want to invert, but it is completely misbehaved because there is no orthogonality and it's hard to do. So 
having written the oldest least squares problem in the book and then the most straightforward solution of it, we also jump to the next step, which is to call this K. It's actually K with an up and a, it's a closed cup, so it's inner outer, okay? And we're going to work in the orthogonal eigenvector decomposition of this matrix K, which we're going to call K, and the eigenvectors are gonna be G, and the eigenvalues are gonna be L, okay? And so G combines its, its spherical harmonics and all these transforms and, you know, between zero and L and then another set between minus uh, one and, and L zero. And so the whole thing sits together and the properties of this uh, matrix are calculable and diagonalizable and we're going to work with the eigenvectors. So if I then jump to the conclusion then Maybe I've dropped a hint here that if, uh, by showing you the Earth and the continents and the ocean, well, this regionalization, if we're going to work with these eigenvectors, I haven't said it in so many words, but you have to anticipate that it's going to sort of carefully separate the region of interest, the region of data availability from the region of not data availability, because after all, that is the root of the ill conditioning of the problem not just the fact that it's way up in altitude, which you get a decay of the, you know, you know, when I blow up with the noise terms, but also because it's not everywhere available, so things don't cancel. And so, with that in mind, working in this basis, it hopefully is somewhat obvious that truncating this basis, but I will make the point, though, that better than this. So now I call it a J, some unknown J, some truncated subset of these eigenvalues and some truncated subset of these uh, eigenfunctions. In fact, if you write down, well, that is then the solution. So if I just pretend I can do it, then J is the complete dimension of the problem, and that is the solution. The ill conditioning comes in from the fact that these eigenvalues decay to zero, sometimes quite rapidly, sometimes not, and I don't want to take the low eigenvalues. If I just slide and cut at a point where the eigenvalues become very, very large, Normally, you'd have structure from everywhere, but because I'm working on this basis, as I will show you, I'm actually capturing the domains of, of data availability, which is the crux of it. And therefore, I'm going to say, well, then, then once you have them, the T wiggles are the estimated coefficients, then I'm going to multiply them by the internal portions of this G, the external portions to get my estimated V at the surface of the Earth or planet, and the estimated W. And for reference here, these inner and outer versions of these G functions are the, just how the coefficients multiply in the original spherical harmonic basis. And that's because that big G, which is the eigenvector matrix of the matrix K, itself, of course, still retains some sort of a memory of what was inner and what was outer. And so it's all bookkeeping. And um, this paper is the one that required a five-page table of symbols to keep it all straight, because it's just a lot of symbols, inner, outer, up, or down, it's just, you know. But we are good at that, we write that down. Okay, so this here then, think about it as a vector spherical harmonic, an outer vector spherical harmonic, an upward and downward continuum operator times the result of some eigenvalue calculation that maps all these product terms, well, it needs a symbol, and so it's called this curly G here, up for up, it's been upped, and then truncated at J. We don't know yet yet. And this here, now the word is out, these are the, I, I, they have a name, okay? They're altitude cognizant, because A is in there, where the satellite was, and they're gradient vector, because they're potential fields, and they're slepian functions, because they diagonalize uh, orthonormal, uh, uh, some positive definite symmetric eigenvector gram matrix K that has built in the interactions between the terms the place of availability, and the fact that some of them need to go up and other ones need to go down and turn scalars into vectors and so on. And so I'll make the link explicitly with the canonical Slepian functions that, that are the prolates Freudal wave functions that you might have learned about in one dimension. Um, and if not, I'll try to make the point. So, all right, what do they look like? You're out there with your satellite at 300 uh, uh, degree altitude and you're trying to look at North America and you have all of this information and you're pretending it's for real. Well, so this is what they look like. This is the radial Slepian function that is the best one for a band limit of 100. And this is the tangential one and the phi dependent one. So these are just the uh, 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 colored components of these functions. 
if you are going to solve such a problem where data are collected at 300 kilometers, you're going to end up working in a basis that effectively looks like this because the first component is this one. So for those of you in, in dimensional uh, reduction, well, the best one is reduced it to one term and also right where you're looking. But you'll need the second one and the third one, and after a while they will be no longer in your area of interest, and that aerial uh, uh, geographic uh, selectivity will give you dimensional reduction because only a handful of them will be of importance to map your um, field onto North America. So, yeah. So if you are willing to write everything I write and you're willing to compute this object, then the one I just showed is the maximizer for, uh, I'll return to that point, so it is a maximizer of something which I haven't shown you, but it's the first eigenvector with the highest eigenvalue of this K matrix. So I chose a band limit, L. I chose to make America <laughs> prominent and that's it so I picked R I picked L and the rest is there okay I haven't expanded anything yet I'm just giving you the dictionary element that is the slapping function itself I haven't said how much of this one I need. it's there's no data right this is just geometry I haven't actually solved any problem. I'm just telling you what those bases functions that I will have as candidates for expansion are looking like if I'm looking at North America from 300 kilometers at a band limit of 100. So these are sort of like atoms that you're going to, but would you have chosen different atoms is my question. Would you, like, would you Norway? <laughs> I mean, any geographic region. So clearly there's a data problem here where you need to say where has the satellite been or where do I want to look and what's the intersection of that? So yes, I could have selected any, anything, but I'm now pretending that I'm interested in North America, which includes Mexico. Um, right, so here's a hundredth element of, out of that dictionary. It has a lot more ripply structure, and, but it's still almost completely confined to the target. If I keep, kept counting, I went to a thousand, you would see the stuff leaking all over the place, and I would say, well, I'm going to not choose that atom. And that's a, another thing here. Well, in principle, we uh, um, include it, but such very, very low order terms, you might want to you know, do a pass before that. I'm just working completely general. I start at zero. I don't really have to. You can write that matrix, and you can do the expansion from any point to any other point. And in fact, that's the point we'll be making, that we might turn that into wavelets and scaling functions by segmenting the band limit into sub-pieces. We do that. So, you know, this was for the internal field. Now, if I have the inner and outer harmonics, I need to solve that more complicated problem. Here's just other elements. This is the first inner basis, the first outer basis, you know, for two completely different band limits. So you're seeing that the, the outer base is at 10. You know, it's, it's pretty leaky, although somewhat still concentrated. Um, and uh, for now two radii, but, so the shell is between 300 and 400 kilometers of altitude. This is the 500 best. You know, the 500 best is not very good at all for the outer field, but you know, there it is. And the 500 best for the out inner field in the complete field solution is still pretty good, and so it's still confined. And so you see these structures sharpening up because at 500 you get a lot more oscillatory behavior. Anyway, so um, what is the relationship to the classical slapping functions? Well, you know, I, I started with an inverse problem, and I wrote a normal matrix with all these interaction of terms, and I make an eigenvector expansion. If we started by asking which, um, which function maximizes when measured over a region, its inner product with itself, combined with the two available inner and outer bases over the entire available surface of the Earth, well, parts of which we only have available, then we would have solved this problem, which would have turned into this problem, which would have turned into this problem. And so we're solving a variational problem that you could just do strictly geometrically. But remember here, 
So if I just wrote this and I said K is the, the interaction of terms in a, in a gram matrix of, of spherical harmonics, it wouldn't know about up or downward or vector or anything. You would have the classical canonical slipping functions or prolate spheroidal functions on the sphere as we have uh, uh, other work on. So testing, a couple of free parameters obviously are, well, how do you pick the truncation? So here, because this is possible, all sorts of techniques are possible. This is a, this is a question of signal to noise. This is a question of, of maybe cross-validation. This is a cro uh, question of maybe iteratively reweighting and so on. So here's just a couple of examples here. This would be the true field. And for a selection of 900 terms out of this inner and ex internal and external basis, this would be the result, the inversion result, when we pretend that we sample this field from a satellite altitude 300 with, I don't remember, 10,000 points and we do, uh, do this thing. So this is the types of things to evaluate. I'm not, it's all simulation. And then, of course, we need to look at what if you truncate at higher or lower values and you need to ride that curve of data fit and, and, and number of terms and try to optimize and signal the noise, which I will return to. But this is the type of plot we look like at, we look at. Okay, so here's a little bit of the statistical analysis because the, I, I'm glad I'm mentioning it here because we haven't heard that much about it. So let me just write the data just again. And so now I'm going to write the data as potentially coming from everywhere. Now this is omega, it's a whole sphere. And I've, um, uh, this is internal field here, so low bandwidth, 2L, the L to infinity component that we'll never have, and then the noise contamination. So I started by writing the data, are these E and F harmonics? Well, I've already done the transformation, and now I'm writing it in the complete slept-in basis, which is, as I said, global and continuous and so on, and it's just a, it's just a transformation. And now, for the first time, I'm going to specify something about the types of signal we want to know, because it's not just, as was mentioned earlier, about finding the best model. It's also about finding a probabilistic interpretation for it. And so here's an example of the curly V here is the expected value. So it's the covariance of V with itself across two points on the sphere. And N is the noise covariance. And of course, there is a single two noise covariance, which I, 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 V dot N where times n is, is assumed to be zero in this, uh, this experiment. So no Gaussianity or anything, just a covariance for now. And so then we calculate, so this is really the contribution of this paper, then we basically write out what is the mean squared error when you solve problems like this in terms of these noise and signal covariances in this basis, truncated to this j, evaluated over this region, and you see it has two terms. There is the term that says, well, whatever you're picking up in your low rank J ranked basis is contaminated by noise. But whatever you're not picking up in your basis is all mean square error because it's all the signal that you haven't picked up. So the noise covariance and then the eigenvalue uh, structure of this slipping problem dictates an, a, a measure of estimation variance in the first term and then a measure of estimation bias in the second term where the, the greater than j is the missing terms after truncation. And what I'm not writing here is the broadband bias terms, which we actually do calculate because you will not know enough about the low bandwidth por portion, but also whatever you do know about the low bandwidth por por portion gets contaminated by the unavoidable but quantifiable a broadband bias, which is a problem in seismology also. You're doing an inversion in a restricted basis and then whatever you haven't accounted for maps as a, as a leakage bias into your low order coefficients. So we calculate that when I'm not writing it. So make it very, very simple. Just pretend it's white signal and white noise, which is in conflict with the whole notion of band limitation, but I'm doing it anyway. And you write out the previous equation, then the mean squared estimation error is just a variance term and a bias term. And the variance comes from noise in the set of the bases that you're including. And the bias terms come from signal that you haven't included. Um, and then we calculate these things theoretically for all these noise models. 
<coughs> and so you're, you're doing then a, a traditional analysis of how does the bias squared rise and how does the variance decay to give you an optimal uh, mean squared uh, minimum error and then compare that to find the optimal number of terms in the basin and then compare that to the a priori noise level n over v that I might have stuck in there in this experiment to see that you are indeed solving the problem but not overdoing it, finding the right balance between having the right number of terms and, and as came up earlier also, is having the right balance between, between the noise variance and the, and the model variance. Well, now we're at it. The full field solution is just a little bit more complicated. The data would be, again, an internal and an external portion, a V and a W portion, and then pieces that we will never get, and then a noise term. And if I jump to the conclusion of white noise and white signal, in this case here, the mean square error for the internal part is, again, a variance term influenced by noise, a bias term influenced by signal in the signal domain that I'm not picking up, and then this term, which is a, an interaction that we haven't completely gotten rid of. There is the mapping of the W of the external field structure onto the mean squared error of the V that you want. And so the, uh, at no point did I suggest that by this procedure we completely the eliminate that you want. And so we're working on the basis. V that you at want. No point so really that the, the, at no point did I suggest that the, the V that terms. you want. And so, so that's the, the unavoidable. At no point did I suggest that the V that you want. And so the external field the, component uh, to the at no point did I suggest that changing everything. The at no point did I suggest that the symbols hold the external at no point did I suggest that then of course that's contaminated by the internal field, which will be much worse because we like to think of other planets as being far away and the planet of interest as something that we have shot a satellite at and stayed close to. So some more examples of how one does, looks at it. Well, the truncation number is J's, and then so you look at the bias over multiple experiments and see if that validates your theory. Standard deviation. So here's a typical example, again, of the 900 variety in North America. And you don't care in this analysis about anywhere else. The bias of such sorts of procedures is, you know, very, very low. And of course, outside, it's all biased because you haven't even wanted it. So if you compare that to uh, uh, nothing, then of course it's all due to signal. Standard deviation is, of course, you know, very bad where we haven't really tried, and very good where you're wanting it. And here, too, the bias and the variance, of course, is on a sliding scale of a J truncation term, which depends on the noise to signal variance in that basis to begin with. And here, that's the same thing, just on a little bit of a, a re reduced scale here, 500 nanoteslas. For those of you who are interested in those numbers, um, uh, you'd have a, a point of reference. OK, back to Mars in the last seven minutes. Um, why did we even do this other than um, why does anyone do anything? Okay, it's because, well, we wanted to look at Mars, but Mars had these global models made, and remember they had these interesting patches, and then people waxed lyrical about plate tectonics on Mars, and there's stripes, and maybe there's that going on, and then, uh, you know, sort of a lively debate. Then Alain and I, you know, Alain, that means when I say Alain and I, I mean Alain, looked through the Mars database and, and found that many of, as one example, of the very low order passes of this satellite during, you know, its so-called arrow breaking phase when it dips close to the surface and then comes back in order to settle into a stable orbit, had data that weren't really used because they're so close to the surface that they're very high quality, but they're too good for the global model. And so they were either not used or didn't carry their full weight into the global inversions. And so we specifically targeted low altitude passes and nighttime passes um, to try to get some crisscrossing segment in this particular area of, of uh, this, you know, uh, Martian uh, South Pole. So that's the idea now of like, how densely are these typical plots sampled? Well, about that densely. So in this white area, we assume that this is fairly well so that we can pixel integrate it, although we can do slightly better than that, in fact, we have. Uh, and then we have uh, a model for this thing. And so here's the thing on the left. This is actually in a Slepian basis that targets this entire ring, specifically. And then here are the anomalies, or rather the field components here. So this is the radial field component in nanotesla at the surface. And then we got 
creative and we targeted individual little disks inside and we did little Slepian analysis on these pieces and see how the total, when put together as a mosaic here, this is M, looks like the complete thing. And so if the sum of the pieces equals the piece of the sum, then uh, we are, we are uh, uh, in a good, good place. So, um, and then we do what we all should do is we compared it back with data. So we picked out a couple of random tracks here, one, two, three, four, five, six. And, and then we upward continued that now known model to that satellite altitude where at 100 kilometer altitude, it sort of looks like that because all the structure has upwardly continued and therefore decayed. And then we're seeing this upside down plot here where what you have to take away is that wherever the dashed line is away from the data and the model, it's somebody else's model that isn't fitting well, okay? Whereas the two graphs that are always really well hugging each other, and then there's error bars because these are all different altitudes and so on, when signal and, uh, sorry, when the model and data fit each other to within what we think of as observational error, away from the dashed line, which is not my business, then we have successfully explained by just random selecting a couple of paths at these altitudes what the radial, collatitudinal, and longitudinal dependence of these, um, of these measurements are. And so that's, a, a, that's our measure of success. Uh, and and uh, then, of course, we look at the distribution of the, of the data. And so this is a radial, collatitudinal, longitudinal for a handful of specific regions, one, to three regions. And so before you start, there is signal to explain. And after you have explained it, our residuals, I'm going to just take away the data here. So whatever we have now not been able to explain is more normal, has much smaller standard deviation, is much better centered, and so on. So uh, I don't have to give the message here, but you know, I tell my students, right, always look at the residuals. If you're done reducing the data, you should see nothing of interest, okay? And so, of course, we, we compare that in this particular paper. So, um, on my title slide, there was a, a name of, of a colleague of mine, Volker Michel, who is at the University of Siegen, and so we have been talking for years, and we just wrote a paper in inverse problems that um, basically explains what it is that we were doing and puts it at a little bit more abstract level. And so here's a bit of the abstract of that paper. It's like essentially we're dealing with, with, with mappings, inverse problems, uh, where we have an SVD. Those little A coefficients are, are how the terms decay up and down. And then they, they are compact, more or less operators. And so we have a global SVD problem, the sort of thing you learn in, in, in electromagnetics from Jackson. And we want to turn that into something that is regionally sensitive. And so a Slepian function really is associated to a region and to an operator and then, and then is a local SVD that we can calculate quite easily. And then once we have a local SVD for an inverse problem, we, we open the textbook of how to solve inverse problems for which there are known SVDs. And then we, we pull out the toolbox of regularization and truncation and so on. And so, um, uh, so all the standard techniques then apply. And then in that paper, which just appeared, it also then makes that other point that came up is that, well, these band limits, they don't have to be you know, all or nothing. They can be pieces. They can, they, they can be um, multi-scale. They can be turned into wavelet and scaling functions. And so, uh, but at the root of it is realizing what the singular value decomposition of, of the physical problem that we have when we have full knowledge, and then identifying the problems due to contamination, band limitation, and regional availability, and then turning that into a new basis for inverse problem that acknowledges that fact, and then working in that basis. And so, you know, uh, like it's building a basis for a satellite acquisition problem that already knows it's going to have to be downward continued by 500 kilometers down, and it just already kind of knows what the signal to noise of this thing is such that none of that is going to blow up, and it already knows where you're sensitive, 
and it already knows you're contaminated by other data. And so all of that knowledge is still um, relatively easy to build into this framework, and that's what we have done. 